I was going to talk about the truth about water. And I, I remember when I was in uh, science class about seventh and eighth grade, they kept on telling you that earth is so weird because it has water and you can't find water any other place in our solar system. I mean, it is such a strange uh, molecule. And they're right. It's a strange molecule. But as we get to see a little bit later on, um, it's pretty much everywhere. Well, let's keep on going. We are a water world, 71% uh, or even sometimes a little more, um, is covered with this material, this, this molecule that we call H2O. Uh, it's the only thing, at least on our planet, that actually demonstrates all three forms and possibly four forms of matter. It's the solid, liquid, and gas, and uh, water can be superheated uh, and have it act like a plasma. So uh, water is an amazing, uh, an amazing material uh, that, that, that demonstrates all the different forms of, of matter. Uh, like I said, about 71, 72% of the earth is covered with water. And between the earth and the moon and the sun, these will form tides and uh, ocean waves. And it covers, well, pretty much the whole, whole earth. Uh, the uh, uh, the earth uh, has uh, an average, actually the average depth of the oceans is somewhere in the vicinity of about 12,000 feet. And uh, the mass, uh, although it's, it's one, one and a third uh, quintillion metric tons, it still only makes up about four hundredths of 1% of the Earth's mass. So, so it covers the Earth, but it doesn't make up a whole lot of mass of the Earth. But we do have an awful lot of fun with it. I mean, let's face it, we can, we can marsh with it, we can throw it up in the air and have it turn to snow, we can fill balloons with it, we can even pull cats into it. I mean, uh, that poor cat, that's kind of sad. Uh, in front of the Bellagio, they have a water display that has entertained millions over the years. And this you know, forms different fountains and they make it spray. And it's just, it's just an amazing display. What's, what's further amazing is the fact that the, the biggest problem they have with that is ice. Now you'd think that they, you know, they squeeze the water and it should get hot. Actually, just the opposite is true because they compress the water tremendously and they actually pull that heat away. And then when the water is released, the sudden release of energy will freeze the water. So again, in front of the Bellagio, they have all sorts of uh, entertaining uh, things with water. Water could also be deadly. Uh, tsunamis in Thailand and Japan have cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, the destruction by a tsunami is complete. No one could, unless you are unbelievably lucky, you, there's no way you can possibly survive one of those. If we take a look at the human body, we find that the human body is actually about 60% water. Uh, you can see that various parts of the body are made up of different uh, amounts of water. Uh, it's interesting that fat is only 20% water. You would think that uh, fat would have a lot more. Uh, 
Meanwhile, our blood is 83% water and our brain is 70, about 75% water. And uh, it seems like the, the more you watch uh, some of the uh, programs that are on TV, that probably gets more and more water as you force out uh, some of the uh, knowledge that you're trying to build in there. The maximum time an individual can go without water, if everything is the best way it could be, is about a week. If things are hot or you're doing any kind of uh, exercise, that drops down to a couple of days. Um, your kidneys fail. Uh, the, the best anyone has been able to do uh, Mahatma Gandhi, when he was doing a complete starvation diet, he was able to last about five days without water, but he was able to last 21 days without food. I don't think I can last 21 hours without food. Well, anyway, let's keep on going. Uh, if you were to take a look at all the water on the earth and figure out how much of that is actually drinkable, you would find that less than 3% of the water on earth is drinkable. The rest of it is salt water. Yet in spite of that, our life is dependent upon this water. In fact, our whole a point of planet habit, habitability is defined by water. The habitable zone as defined um, by uh, scientists is that place where water could exist in a liquid form. And this area of, uh, of liquid water is actually uh, quite small. If you were to take a look at our solar system, it would actually extend beyond the orbit of Venus to just, just within the orbit of Mars. So we're kind of, we're kind of uh, more toward the hot side of things. Uh, Mars is a little bit closer to the cooler side of things, but the way we define our habitable zone, if it's too close, it's too hot. That would be like Mercury and Venus. If it's too cool, be too, and it would be too far away. Um, Mars is actually on the borderline of that. Everything beyond Mars is too cool. Sounds like it's a goal. They call that the Goldilocks zone for a reason. It's just right. The other thing is the fact that the size of the planet also comes into play here. The planet size uh, really can't be much more than twice the size of the Earth because then you get into gravitational problems that would uh, eliminate some of that habitable zone. So water exists, at least uh, in some way, shape or form uh, between actually Venus and Saturn, but liquid water, as you can see, uh, is just a little bit inside of Mars and, and uh, just a little bit outside of, of Earth. So we're kind of in the kind of the phase change area there. But the neat thing about water is the fact that it is ideal for carbon chemistry. And as far as we know, carbon chemistry is the only chemistry we know that sustains life. There could be others, we just haven't found it yet. So, and as a result, liquid, the, the liquid water is the only material that could sustain that life. So while carbon chemistry could operate 
in lower temperatures, the reactions would be grossly slowed down. And as a result, you wouldn't have the viability of life that you would find on the earth. Now, what are some of the characteristics that water has that make it so wonderful? Well, for one thing, the water is a temperature stabilizing material. Liquid water could absorb a great deal of heat before the temperature rises. It also holds the heat, so it could distribute that heat in, in local areas. So much of that heated heat is actually disrupts the hydrogen bonding rather than increasing the movement of the molecules. So as a result, water will evaporate. The molecules will lose their bonding and will evaporate into uh, oxygen and hydrogen and uh, whatever other elements that happen to be in there. If you take a look at the water distribution and how it stabilizes uh, temperature on the earth, it's rather, it's rather startling. Uh, here you have uh, water on the earth and you can see the, the total difference in temperature in the temperature range is about 30 degrees. So that's from the coldest water temperature to the hottest water, water temperature. And yet that will stabilize temperatures on the earth so that uh, life would be possible on, in those areas. The water will actually contribute to the climate uh, stabilization for countries that would be far north or south of the equator, uh, like the Arctic or the Antarctic. Now, what also helps on this is the fact that as the world turns, it causes something called the Coriolis effect. And that effect actually causes currents in the oceans, which is also helped by the shape of the continents. Now, these characteristics of the flow will actually contribute to the climate of various countries. For instance, as you can see off the east coast of the, of the United States, we have something called the Gulf Stream. And that Gulf Stream actually will work its way up to the North Atlantic, and that will affect the climate of the UK. A disruption in the flow of that Gulf Stream will mean a radical climate change in the UK. Some of the international laws that have been passed forbid countries to actually use these climatic effect streams to power, let's say, underwater turbines and stuff like that. So it's a uh, these these streams, these Gulf streams, or the uh, uh, circumpolar streams, are necessary to distribute or to actually stabilize the climates around the Earth. And we'll actually have a conveyor belt type of system. If you were to throw something into one of these streams, theoretically. It could actually travel around the earth and end up where it started from, theoretically. That's if it doesn't go into a, a, a ship that happens to be passing by or a big clump of, uh, of plastic waste or any one of those things. So water is a tremendous uh, energy stabilizer. As such, uh, water could actually aid in, in the, uh, the, the uh, modification of energy. Our perspiration uh, causes us to lose energy. Uh, it's primary in, in mammals. Uh, 
we, let's face it, we sweat, some more than others. But uh, as a result of that, we actually lose energy when we do that. So we keep cool. It doesn't help clothing at all. And of course, the smell is could be rather, uh, well, severe. However, mammals do require some kind of energy release. Since dogs don't have sweat glands, they will actually sweat through their tongues, and that's why they pant. Um, I'm not quite sure what ducks do, but according to this, it looks like they sweat, but I'm not sure if uh, Disney was uh, part of that. You can use water to cool your backyard. Uh, in fact, uh, let's say if you lived in uh, Arizona or you lived in an area that has a high temperature and relatively low humidity, you can put a very, uh, a very active mister in your backyard and just having the, uh, this water mist will actually pull energy out of the hot air and cool the air around your house. As you can see in that, in the chart that I have there, if the air temperature is, is 110 degrees and your relative humidity is in the single digits, you can actually lower your temperature by more than 30 degrees. That's pretty substantial. Uh, the biggest problem I saw with this when I was in Arizona visiting a friend was the fact that you do have to keep those misters clean or else it doesn't mist very well. Having a dribble doesn't work well. So as a result, you keep the mister clean and you can lower the temperature of your backyard by a tremendous amount of uh, temperature or you're pulling the energy out of the air. The other thing that water is good for is using it to do work. Uh, water could turn generators if it's coming from a high area to a low area, let's say if you're uh, using hydroelectric. So it'll actually go through the penstock and turn a turbine that will generate electricity. Steam will uh, generate pist will actually push and pull pistons that will drive steam engines. Or the steam, again, uh, be, uh, being heated by, let's say, a nuclear reactor, will again turn a turbine that will generate electricity. So uh, steam or very hot water could do all of these things. And uh, steam is not that hard to make. The other thing that, that one more thing that water is good for is the fact that water has a very high cohesion. In other words, the hydrogen bonding that holds molecules in a liquid together uh, could actually climb against gravity. You may wonder, how, how are the leaves at the top of trees getting nourishment? Well, that's through uh, something called water cohesion, where it allows the water to move in a continuous column up through the stems of plants. And as a result, they can get to the top of trees. This cohesion is also what causes water to hold on to itself. When the astronauts are uh, in the International Space Station, one of the things they have to do is take a shower or else they don't make too many friends up there. So as a result of that, they could actually take a shower and if they're not moving around much, the water will adhere to their bodies, at which point 
they would take a vacuum cleaner or vacuum and simply suck the water off their body. As you can see, uh, water in a, in a weightless condition will form a blob. And this blob will stay a blob until it hits something else. This can be dangerous. Uh, when Apollo 13 was coming back from the moon after uh, the, the temperature inside was actually around 35 to 40 degrees, a great deal of condensation uh, developed on the panels. And there was a real uh, scary point there where they thought that a lot of that condensation would cause short circuits as soon as they started turning on some of the power. As it turned out, it didn't, but the, the, uh, the uh, uh, fear was real. Now, the other thing that water does with cohesion is something called uh, surface tension. These hydrogen bonds will actually come together and cause a sort of skin on top of the water. As a result, bugs could actually take advantage of the surface tension, tension and actually skirt their way through or on top of the water. If you're careful, you can actually take a needle, a sewing machine needle. And if I can say, if you're careful, you can actually drop it on a, uh, let's say on a glass of water and it'll actually float on top of the water. Now, the best way to disrupt that cohesion is to drop a little bit of soap on it and that will break down all the surface tension and anything you have on top of that, including bugs, will suddenly drop to the bottom of anything that has water in it. But the surface tension and this cohesion uh, also plays games with you, especially if you're working in the kitchen and you forget what you're doing. Uh, this capillary action will cause water again, just like in trees, will cause water to climb the stems and the roots and be able to feed leaves on uh, very high points in the tree. However, and I'm not sure how many of you done that, done this, I know I have, and felt really stupid in the, in the next morning, I left a towel in the sink the sink had some water on it, and the towel was draped over the side of the sink. The next morning, there was a big puddle on the floor. Um, I blame the cat, so I just will go ahead and just leave it on that. Because obviously, the cat was in the water, churning it up, and it caused it to fall on the floor. Well, anyway, but that's as a result of water cohesion. It will actually uh, be pulled up into the rag or into the towel and will go to the lowest point, which is actually uh, over the sink and onto the floor. Now, one of the big questions on this is, why does ice float? And in ice, hydrogen bonds lock molecules in a lattice. That's a very uh, a fancy way of saying that it forms it in some type of a pattern. And this pattern is actually spaced further apart in ice than it is in liquid water because the lattice or the, or the, uh, the uh, water is actually molecules are spaced further away Ice is less dense than water. Now, one of the big questions comes, where does our water come from? And there are lots of theories about this. One theory states that our water actually uh, was 
emitted or actually uh, oozed up out of the interior of the earth and uh, ended up in the oceans and stuff. Where it was in there, we don't know. However, another theory uh, states that a lot of the water came to us via comets and asteroids and actually crashed onto the earth and released the water. This was actually shown uh, to be a very strong possibility when a comet uh, fairly nearby happened to be melted by the sun and they found a gaseous cloud of vaporized water that seemed to form out of this. So yes, water did definitely come out of that particular comet. The other thing which happens is the fact that water is on the earth. And I could tell you that there's a lot of water on the ground on, around the earth. And there's also a lot of ocean water. Now, if, if you were to take an ice cube and have it melt on a, in a glass, the level in that glass will not change. So if you're melting ice in a glass, it won't change. As a result, you can reliably say that if there was any ocean ice, if that ocean ice melted, if all the ocean ice melted, water levels on the earth would not change that much. Now, the big question is, what happens if the land mass water started to melt? Well, then we have uh, places like Florida and other places like that underwater, but it wouldn't be caused by the ocean ice. The, the things that, that astronomers and scientists are working right now, again, where, where did the ice, where did the water come from? And according to the more modern theories, a little bit later we'll get into this, most, well, I'm going to say most, but a lot of our water was here in our solar system before we were. So, um, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. Uh, now, water is also the great destructor, and we've all done this, uh, called frost wedging. Uh, it causes the, uh, uh, the holes in our streets, causes our uh, sidewalks to splinter, uh, causes our, our water lines that happen to be outside to break. And again, when water freezes, it will actually expand. Now, until water reaches 39 degrees, it will contract just like everything else contracts as it gets co colder. But at 39 degrees, water will start to expand. That's where that lattice work of molecules will actually begin to expand. And as a result, when you have frozen water it'll occupy more space than liquid water and it will break rocks, it'll break pipes and will cause all sorts of destruction in your garage. <laughs> that's, wow, that's horrible. Now, the other thing which, uh, was recently, at least they were trying to answer this, is why is ice slippery? There doesn't seem to be a reason for this. Now they were using all sorts of ways of describing how, well, when you're on ice, you're actually melting just a little bit of ice where the tire meets the road or where the ice skate blade meets the ice and as a result you're melting that little bit of of ice and that causes to, that that acts like a lubricant 
that's all well and good until you start getting into extremely low temperatures that are somewhere around 40 or 50 degrees below zero, at which point it should melt like that. So actually uh, chemical engineers were looking at ice, trying to figure out what it is that actually makes the ice slippery. And what they discovered was the fact that when ice is formed and you have that lattice work of molecules, there are a lot of extra molecules that have been forced out of that lattice. And they act like marbles that are on a flat surface. So when you are walking on that and you're walking on ice, what you are slipping on are those extra molecules that act like marbles and you slip on. Now there's a real interesting thing. I mean, you'd probably never thought that uh, water actually gives up some of its molecules when it turns to ice. Now, another thing that ice is really good for, and this is really the A number one prime reason why we have to have water, is the fact that water is a good solvent. If you were to take, um, well, even these reports and put them into water, given time, they will dissolve and simply uh, be part of the water. Water is a tremendous solvent. And it actually, when water molecules dissolve things, the water molecules will actually cluster around its ions and keep them separated. And this is the exact thing why water is needed. Water is the necessary liquid for life. Yay! Now, moving water causes land formations and amazing gullies and wonderful waterfalls. But what it's doing is actually carving out a lot of the materials that are in those rocks. Those rocks will have carbon, they'll have magnesium, they'll have all sorts of things that are necessary for the formation of, of life. They've also found that a lot of these necessary things for life, including water, comes from outer space. Uh, uh, asteroids and uh, meteorites and all sorts of things that come from space are heavy in the molecules, in the elements that we need for life. And what I want you to do right now is take a look at this and see what is the most repeated element that you see here. You have C, H, O, you have an N in there, but it's mainly C, H, and O. That's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those are the most common elements of life. And they have been found in asteroids and meteor, meteorites. And in fact, they've actually been able, to, they've actually analyzed even further some of the chemical makeup of uh, meteorites and they have found amino acids, simple amino acids in some of these asteroids. So the very, very basic parts of proteins have been found in things that come from outer space. And these things will actually, when they 
come from outer space, they'll be dropped onto the Earth where water as a solvent will actually dissolve these elements into these tidal basins. Um, don't worry about that little boy. He was never dissolved. Okay, he's just standing there watching life begin in that little tidal pond. So we're just gonna leave him alone. Okay, so we have these tidal basins where materials are being gathered up and they will form eventually into some type of a proton. protein. Now, in the early 1950s, two scientists by the name of Miller and Urey actually performed an experiment that used what was believed to be the early atmosphere of the Earth. Um, it was basically uh, hydrogen, uh, so a little bit of oxygen, it was ammonia and methane, and they put everything into a test tube and they filled it with water. Then they uh, heated the water and methane, ammonia, water, and hydrogen gases were mixed and it was sparked with a sparker. And what they found was the fact that the energy from all that actually changed those basic gases into amino acids or simple proteins. This is a natural process. It's a process that's going on all the time. Uh, so they were able, you now this is not by any means life. Believe it or not, we don't know how to make life, how to actually take uh, all of the elements and come out with an elephant on the other side. I'm not quite sure if we would really want to, but uh, we don't know how to do that yet. But we do know that what makes all this work are the bonding of the elements. And we have lots and lots of different, we have lots of different kinds of bonds. We have something called covalent bonds, which are, which is where uh, uh, atoms will actually share electrons and they will actually come together. They will share electrons and form more complex elements or more complex molecules. Then we have something called ionic bonds where uh, an electron will actually go from one element to the other and then because of their uh, difference in charges, these two elements will come together. These are called ionic bonds. So we have covalent bonds, we have ionic bonds, and the most powerful bond of all is of course the James bond. I think I have every one of them in there, so, uh, oh well. Uh, Sorry about that. Actually, the third type of bond is known as the hydrogen bond. That's B-O-N-D, not B-O-M-B. So the hydrogen bond is actually an extremely strong bond. And it's the bond that is actually uh, a part of our lives. It's the thing that makes uh, well, it, it's, it helps us digest food. Uh, all the things that are necessary for life involve the hydrogen bond. And the hydrogen bond is most active with carbon. Uh, the carbon uh, bond is extremely powerful. And, one, and it's also the reason why carbon is the element of life and why silicon probably is not. You might find a couple of uh, aliens maybe on some other planet 
that might use silicon as a basis for life. But here on the earth, you're not going to find that. You will find the basis of life on the earth is carbon. And the reason for that is the ionization energy. That's the amount of energy that it takes to pull away one of those electrons. One of those electrons. So ionization is when you are when you take an electron away from an atom. As you can see, the ionization energy for carbon is 11.26. The ionization energy for silicon is 8.15. And as a result, uh, carbon is the basis. That's the elemental basis of life. If carbon behaved like silicon, the life essential molecules would fall apart too easily or react spontaneously at standard earth temperatures, rendering carbon-based life impossible. So it's a good thing that we have carbon based life, and we have so much carbon on the earth. In fact, almost anything that involves energy for life forms is based upon carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It's also because of because of the energies involved. It's involved in the building of DNA and the formation of different life forms. And all this began in a little tidal pond that was getting energy from the sun. And as these tidal ponds were getting energy from the sun, these molecules that had carbon, oxygen, and, and, uh, and hydrogen in there would begin to come together. Uh, some of them would be forming RNA in bacteria. And this bacteria would mutate because of the sunlight and eventually keep on trying over and over again until finally the mutant bacteria would actually thrive. It took hundreds of billions of tests and reproductions of all these different elements to finally come up with some type of a life form it took the sun's energy, and then in this active organic soup, actually formed life. And the big question is, how did it do it? And other than the fact that it did it over and over again, so many billions of times, um, it's, a, it's a question that has yet to be answered. So the lucky life forms are the ones that have lived through this life soup. And this water is actually found everywhere in our solar system. So anywhere in our solar system you travel, you will find water. I mean, the, the, the list is virtually never ending. So uh, we're going to talk about some of these things, but we're not, obviously not all of them, or else you'd be here for a week. And I'm not quite sure you would want to be. I don't know, maybe some of you, I don't know, I won't get into that. Any, anyway, let's keep on going here. Now, if we, we can start 
in the center of our solar system where we have the sun. And our sun is emitting active hydrogen particles. Um, these are called uh, protons. These are active protons. Uh, it's actually part of the solar wind. And in these active protons, uh, there's an occasional oxygen in there. So we have oxygen, some oxygen, not very much, but some oxygen and lots of hydrogen uh, particles coming together, all moving away from the sun. Now, if you have an oxygen and a hydrogen molecule, those are called hydroxyls. So if you're wondering where the term hydroxyls come from, uh, now you know. Do you realize how hard it is to find a hydrox cookie now? Anyway, um, so this solar wind is blowing all of these hydroxyls out through our solar system. One of the places where they found water, and actually water ice, is on Mars. Now that we had a little scooper on the, uh, on the probe that landed there, and I kind of uh, dug a little hole and you can see that it's changing over time. Actually, uh, it's, this is when it first happened. And then about two or three minutes later, we can see that a lot of that water ice has sublimated. It kind of just went away because Mars does not have enough te temperature and pressure to be able to hold water. So any water on the surface of Mars is pretty much supplemented away. But we do have proof of running water on Mars. And if you take a look at these uh, pictures, you can see that we have water running down our cliffs of Mars. Uh, we have uh, water as part of the uh, uh, formation on Mars. We have condensation on the legs of these, uh, these probes. So this is an ongoing thing. And we have found areas on Mars that have liquid water. Uh, and in fact, right now they are plotting these areas in order to land here. And then sometime in the future to be able to actually find this water on, on Mars. Don't know what we're gonna find in it, but another place where they have found water is on Ceres, which is one of the asteroids going around Mars. And Ceres is the largest object in the asteroid belt. Um, and it actually changes brightness over time. And uh, they think it might have something to do with some of the water on, Mar on Ceres. But we do know that there is a very thin, dusty outer crust. There is a rocky inner core based upon its mass. And in between, there is a layer of ice, water ice. One of the things that they found is the fact that there are places on this asteroid where the sun will actually never reach. And there is a reason to believe that water could be at the bottom of these craters. They did find water ice on Mercury in these craters that would never get sunlight. So it is certainly possible. And they've also found water ice on the moon, again, in the southern part of the moon, where the sunlight never reaches. The moon, uh, Jupiter's moon Ganymede, uh, they have found has a great deal of life. And based upon how that uh, moon has heated, there is also the possibility of life, possibly in the form of what's been called extremophiles. In other words, life forms that exist in very, very hostile conditions. Looking at Ganymede, uh, you can see 
that is uh, does have a hot interior. And we know that there is water on here because at one time it actually blew a plume of water more than 125 miles above the surface of that moon. The moon Europa also has a interior of water ice because it too is blowing out plumes of very hot water that we have been able to see uh, here, actually have been able to see on the uh, probe Juno, which actually went around that particular moon and took pictures of the plume that was coming off there. According to the data uh, uh, collected by the probe Galileo, they found that Europa actually has more water in it than the Earth does. So Europa would be a primary place to visit simply because you would have water to live on, you would have water to extract oxygen from, and you would have also water to be able to uh, split apart and use the hydrogen as rocket fuel. So taking a look at the what's at the interior of Europa, uh, you can see the possibilities for it. Uh, uh, Enceladus uh, had to put the accent in the right place. Enceladus, I've always said Enceladus. Anyway, Enceladus is the moon going around Saturn and they didn't know there was water on it until the uh, Cassini actually went through the cloud of water on this moon and they found just tons of water being emitted into the atmosphere. Titan, the uh, major moon going around uh, Saturn, has water in its interior. However, this is a methane world. And as you actually went through the atmosphere, we actually landed a uh, little probe on there. And we'll be talking about that in one of the future of uh, talks, uh, it actually found water uh, as part of the interior of Titan. And Titan could very easily have life on it, uh, just didn't know what to look for. As you can see, it's a very hazy planet. The internal structure, again, would have uh, the, uh, an, ice, an in internal ice ocean. So in spite of uh, Titan's organic atmosphere, the Cassini probing probably discovered a global salty ocean beneath the surface. Now, where did all this stuff come from? Now we know that there's lots of hydrogen out there. We know that there's lots of uh, helium out there. Where did the oxygen come from? And to do that, we need to go back in time. We need to follow the beginnings of our solar system, actually the beginnings of the universe into the beginnings of our solar system and into the uh, life of our solar system. So stars are formed, our galaxy is formed. From our galaxy, uh, we have stars forming. Uh, <clears throat> and inside those stars, we have hydrogen uh, because of the tremendous pressure being changed into helium. This is called nucleosynthesis. And as the cloud of hydrogen will condense, temperatures increase to the point where the hydrogen 
will react and become helium. And I'm kind of rushing through because I'm lasting a lot longer than I should have. Anyway, we have the, the first stars being formed uh, inside the star. We have hydrogen changing to helium, and this is called fusion. And this fusion, even though it releases 3.5 million electron volts, that's not really very much. You would need hundreds of billions of these things in order to generate the energy that is inside a star. And what's happening inside a star is the fact that the, there is a great deal of outward pressure because of the uh, reactions inside that star that's changing hydrogen into helium. And the star is being pushed out by this, these reactions. The mass of the star is pushing in because of gravity. And what you have is a balance. It's called um, equostatic, uh, equostatic equilibrium, hydrostatic equilibrium, hydrostatic equilibrium. And as a result of that, we have the uh, star changing hydrogen into helium. The helium is now a waste product and it concentrates in the middle of that star. And as it concentrates in the middle of that star, the core gets bigger and bigger. It pushes out the outer envelope of that star. As a result, the star gets bigger and bigger. And as it does, it gets uh, hotter. The inside of the star gets hotter and the star will actually start to react with the helium. And the helium will actually be combined into carbon. So that's where our carbon comes from. It's actually a step in how a star lives. This is called nucleosynthesis. And again, we have protons coming together to form heavier and heavier elements. And that happens until we have formed iron. When we start to form iron, then things really go haywire because it takes more energy to make iron into something else than that star has. As a result, when you start to make iron, you know that the death knell of that star has started and the star will explode. And now all of those elements that were in that star have now combined into the heavier elements. All of the elements of our periodic table were formed in that supernova explosion. But the first 26 of them were actually formed within the star itself. And as the star condenses, it will actually form a solar system and that's where we come in. And what's amazing is the fact that water is a part of all that. Water was formed. Uh, actually, uh, when the star was being formed, at least the hydroxyls were being formed. When the star exploded, you had steam. And as a result, the first molecules, the first molecules, that were made were water molecules. And we have found out that water molecules are the oldest molecules. And they were there when the earth was formed. The most common elements in the universe are hydrogen, number one. Number two is helium. Number three, is oxygen, and number four is, is carbon. So H2O is the oldest molecule in the solar system. It was there when the universe 
shortly after the universe formed. It was there with the explosion of our supernovas. It was there when the earth was formed and it became part of the earth. And when the earth was bombarded by asteroids and uh, comets, the water was released by these objects and was collected on the earth. So it was accumulating iron and it was also accumulating water. Now what's interesting, at least I find it interesting, is the fact that there's two kinds of water. Taking a look at the formation of a galaxy, you can see that there is something called para water and there's ortho water. And the big question is, what's the difference? As you can see on the left, ortho water has the electrons moving in the same direction. At least the, um, the uh, hydrogen uh, electrons. In para water, one of those hydrogen electrons is actually spinning the opposite way. And the big question is, who cares? I mean, really, isn't water water? I mean, does is there a difference between having water that spins one direction and water that spins in another direction? Well, some scientists that didn't know what else to do decided to collect them. He figured out a way of collecting, actually separating ortho water and para water. And what he found was the fact that para water could be collected and stored and ortho water could be collected someplace else and stored. And then he started doing experiments with these different types of water. Do they look different? No, they look exactly the same. However, the para water actually reached about, actually reacted 23% faster than the ortho water. In addition, uh, the energy curves of, of these reactions were more vertical with the para water. So if you want to make your plants grow faster, use para water. Now the big question is, how do I get it? And it took several millions of dollars worth of equipment and a couple of years of research to be able to get this far. But they discovered that the para water in reacting stole more electrons than the ortho water. So the para water is definitely more criminal than the ortho water. So para water steals, as you can see, atoms steal electrons and you gotta keep an eye on them. I've lost an electron, of course, are you positive? Uh, well, sorry, I get carried away with stuff like that. Anyway, they have found new galaxies, actually new solar systems being born where water, both types of water are prevalent in there. And during the Kepler survey, they found lots and lots of worlds where there's water on them. Um, finding water vapor on distant worlds was almost a norm. Uh, you know, they, they found water on this particular world, which is about, uh, oh, it's about 430 light years away. It orbits, um, this particular planet orbits its sun every four and a half Earth days. I mean, it's just, you know, they found water there. Uh, looking at other uh, things in our solar system, uh, they found 
uh, water virtually everywhere uh, in looking at uh, other galaxies. Uh, they found water uh, around uh, new formations, around uh, new uh, proto-solar systems. Uh, so it, it comes, and this is again, a, a 180 degree change from the early 1960s. Not only do we find water on the earth, but we find water everywhere. Like I say, we've even found water on the sun. Of course, it's not going to be liquid, but it is going to be steam. And they seem to congregate around sunspots. So water is everywhere. And um, it's such an important part of our life it would seem logical that at some point in the future, the government will take it over like they did with, with a lot of our drugs and they'll actually require prescriptions for water as well. Not quite sure when that'll be, hopefully it'll be never, but you never can tell. Anyway, um, if, if water was rediscovered now, you would definitely be required a prescription on it. Uh, so, in wine, there's wisdom, in beer, there's freedom, and in water, there is life. Next week, Velikovsky was right. Kind of, almost, sort of. Obviously, we'll be talking about Jupiter. <laughs>